Intercellular signaling and communication is a hallmark of all multicellular life, and the various cells of our bodies have evolved a variety of mechanisms for communicating with one another. For instance, cells in our pancreas secrete insulin into the bloodstream, which is taken up by cells elsewhere in the body, instructing them to change their metabolic activity. Some cells can communicate mechanically. Cells in our skin are anchored to one another and influence each other by stretching and physical coupling. However, no cell in our body is so exquisitely adapted to the job of communication as the neuron. As we learned in the first module of MCB-ADX, the electrical properties of the membranes of neurons enable them to robustly send electrical signals over long distances, far longer than diffusion would allow alone. But the real magic of neurons lies in their connections to one another. There are a number of different ways that one neuron can pass a signal to another, so let's take a moment to look at some of the broad categories of synapses. Arguably, the simplest way to pass a signal from one neuron to the next is to simply connect the two neurons together and rely on the electrical properties of the conjoined cells to carry the signal from cell to cell. This arrangement is called an electrical synapse. In an electrical synapse, there's a physical pore that allows ions to flow through, creating an intercellular current from the upstream neuron to the downstream neuron. The depolarization in the downstream neuron caused by this current if it reaches threshold, can then cause a propagation of the action potential down the downstream neuron. The main advantage of this system is that it's very fast. For this reason, it's often used in reflex circuits such as escape reflexes that require very fast conduction in a multi-neuron circuit. Another feature of being physically connected is that it allows bidirectional signaling. Cell A can cause cell B to fire and vice versa. Because of this bidirectionality and speed, Electrical synapses are also good when synchrony is desired. The heart relies on this phenomenon in order to beat in unison. We haven't talked about it yet, but the heart muscle cells fire action potentials not unlike those fired by neurons. The electrical synapses between the heart muscle cells enable them to fire synchronously, organizing their contraction into a unified, purposeful beat. For a long time, scientists believed that the nervous system was connected up entirely using electrical synapses. However, it turns out that a second, much more complex category of synapses is much more common in our nervous system. These synapses are called chemical synapses, and they rely on the release of chemical substances into a very small space between two neurons called the synaptic cleft. This cleft is very small, about 20 to 40 nanometers in size. That's about a thousandth of the width of a human hair. It needs to be this small, since the signaling molecules must traverse this gap by diffusion. In a chemical synapse, the two cells are electrically separate entities. An action potential in one cell doesn't directly spread to the other cell. Instead, a chemical signal is released by the presynaptic, or upstream cell, and then it's received by the postsynaptic, or downstream cell. Only after this signal is received can it possibly cause the downstream postsynaptic neuron to fire. As you might imagine, with all this extracellular signaling, chemical synapses are much slower than electrical synapses. But what they lack in speed, chemical synapses have a number of essential advantages over electrical synapses, and these advantages make them the dominant kind of synapse in mammalian nervous systems. One key advantage of the chemical signaling is diversity. Electrical synapses essentially have one type of signal, voltage, that they use to transmit information. They can relay a signal more or less unaltered, but that's about it. On the other hand, there's a huge diversity in signaling possible in chemical synapses. Some chemical signals tell the postsynaptic neuron to increase or decrease their likelihood of firing. These chemicals are called neurotransmitters. Other chemicals, such as the one that you may have heard of, like serotonin or dopamine or epinephrine, perhaps better known as adrenaline, can have different, more complicated, longer-term effects in neuronal circuits. These substances are broadly known as neuromodulators, since they modulate the activity of neurons. Another key property of the chemical synapse is that it enforces directionality. In contrast to electrical synapses, which pass signals in both directions, in a chemical synapse, chemicals are released from one side of the synapse, and these signals are received by the postsynaptic cell. Except in special cases, this enragement ensures that the signals flow just one way. Finally, 
Another key advantage of the chemical synapse is that it decouples the arrival of an incoming action potential from the generation of an action potential in the downstream neuron. While an action potential arriving at the electrical synapse will generally pass into the postsynaptic cell and cause a new action potential, the arrival of an action potential at the chemical synapse doesn't guarantee that a spike will occur in the postsynaptic cell. Instead, it's not uncommon for downstream neurons to require multiple incoming spikes arriving from multiple sources or close in time in order to reach threshold in the postsynaptic cell. This notion of summation across time and space is an incredibly important notion to the computational properties of neuronal circuits. And we'll discuss these issues in greater depth in a future unit. Thank you.